Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, Dr. Volkan talked about context. Uh, the context is China. So I'm going to give you uh, a very brief overview of Chinese history. So this is what I'm going to talk about today in the next hour or so. Then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Volkan so he can talk about Zanzu, uh, the art of war. Much of this is related to what I'm talking about here. So um, you can take this down, uh, but this basically just outlines some of the main ideas. Uh, the context here is to uh, provide you with some of the uh, major elements of uh, Chinese culture that would ultimately also influence the martial arts. So um, what we do have is, uh, in particular, the idea of the mandate of heaven. So I'm going to talk briefly about that. Ancestor worship. Uh, when we get into the spring and autumn period and the era of warring states, we basically talk about a hundred schools of philosophy. Um, we're not going to give you a hundred schools of philosophy, but we're basically going to introduce three to you. And uh, Taoism and Confucianism, Dr. Balkan will talk much about you, so I'm going to limit myself to legalism. That's uh, one of the main ideas, because that would ultimately also lead to the centralization of China under the so-called uh, Qin dynasty. So, just a little bit of background here. Uh, most of what you're seeing is before the year zero, so that hence the BCE. Uh, world historians don't use uh, the BC no more, we use CE, which means Common Era. So BCE stands for Before Common Era. Yeah. And that's partially because, uh, as you know, you know a little bit about history, uh, most historians have developed models based on Europe that are not necessarily comparable with the models that you see in China. Uh, the way they regard history, the, the way they even uh, look at history is very different than the context of how the West looks at history. So that's just a little bit of background. So I'm going to talk about a couple of dynasties here. Uh, the Shia, the Shang, the Zhou, the Zhou, and ultimately the Qin. Uh, there's, of course, a lot more, um, but that for later. Just to set the stage for some of the martial arts that's coming your way. The best way to... Okay. Doesn't seem to work. Best way to uh, basically talk about uh, Chinese history is to put it in context. And the context here is uh, world history. And those of you who have taken world history introductory courses know that... Uh, the first major step that we as human beings took forward is when we move into what we call the Great River of Civilizations. And uh, of course the Great River of Civilizations, you know them, uh, there's the Nile that ultimately leads to the civilization of Egypt, uh, the pyramids, and etc. Uh, one of the major cradles also of, um, you know, especially Western culture, but also culture in the Middle East, is of course uh, the area we know as Mesopotamia basically means the land between two rivers, and here we have the Tigris and the Euphrates, and, and it's here, of course, that you have the development of places like Babylon, for instance, and uh, you also have, obviously, here the cradle of some of the major religions, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Judaism, so all of this, uh, of course, happening there. Another major uh, civilization centers around the Indus Valley in India, and it's here, of course, where you see the beginning of Hinduism, and ultimately uh, Buddhism as well as some of the major influences. However, uh, since this is about China, we're really focusing on what happens in China. And there too, we have uh, a major civilization developing in between two major rivers. The two rivers are the Yellow River and the Yangtze River. To show you this on the map, this is the Yellow River right over here and this is the Yangtze River. And the development of the Chinese civilization will happen in between these two major rivers. Uh, you see that uh, the dynasties we're talking about start small, uh, but slowly start expanding, and by the time we get into the Qin, most of this will be unified. Okay. And uh, what we're not talking about today is you also have a major conflict, major conflict between sedentary society that practice agriculture, uh, also animal husbandry, and nomadic societies 
um, and uh, Dr. Corbett, who will be coming in, will talk to you about the Mongols, because that's an also a major impact on Chinese history as well. Now, uh, the Yellow River uh, is not a peaceful river. And if you know anything about China, uh, you, you read in the news often um, that the Chinese rivers are not uh, peaceful flowing rivers. You can compare and contrast that, for instance, with the Nile. Uh, the Nile in Egypt is generally not as violent. Uh, it floods, but when the Nile River floods, it's very peaceful. It doesn't destroy a lot of things. That's very different when you get to the Yellow River. Uh, the Yellow River has sometimes been nicknamed the Sorrow of China. Because when the, river, when the Yellow River floods, it takes with it lots of human life, lots of property, a lot of livestock, and it really devastates China for many, many years. So, and why is that? Um, and that, of course, what is in a name? Why is the Yellow River called Yellow River? That has much to do with the particular type of soil that you find in the area surrounding the Yellow River this particular soil is known as Loess. That's actually German. And it's a very fine soil. And uh, this fine soil mixes with the water and it gives us the consistency and the color almost of soup, consequently Yellow River. But at the same time, since you have the suspension of the particles, these particles will often collect on the shores of the river, prevent it from flowing straight and cause these massive flows and massive floods that you ultimately see throughout Chinese history. So on one hand, less, less soil is great because as a deposit, and the rivers deposit the soil, it enables you to work with this soil because it's, it's highly fertile, it's easily workable. You don't even need, at the beginning, uh, you can use even wooden tools to work in less soil. Later on, of course, you will introduce bronze. Uh, ultimately, you will have iron. But uh, there is a good thing about this, but there's also bad things. Anybody knows the kind of crops that you will find in China? Rice. Rice, rice yes. Rice is ultimately introduced from Southeast Asia. Soybeans. Soybeans would come later. Millet. Right? Or, uh, Millet. Millet. That's probably the most important one. And as time goes on, uh, wheat and barley will be introduced from Mesopotamia. Because one of the major characteristics of these major river civilization is long distance trade. So there's a lot of long distance trade going on. And um, so one of the major problems that Chinese rulers were facing very early on is trying to control these rivers, trying to somehow get these rivers under control. So um, the damage that these rivers do wouldn't be as devastating. So what you have is um, the management of these rivers being central to the formation of some of the first states in China. And the very first state, and this is interesting because up until recently we thought it was just mythological. We know some stories about it, but historians weren't really sure that this particular dynasty, known as the Xia dynasty, really existed. We just knew this from historical records. Um, but archaeologists have now uncovered some evidence that there was actually such a dynasty. And it's centered <coughs> right around here. Um, that's where the Shia dynasty, um, basically, that's where it was located. So what, what you have in the Shia dynasty is a number of cultural heroes. And the names are here, you don't need to memorize them, but just remember Yao, Shun, and Yu. Uh, these are three individuals who consolidated the power in the Shia, Shia dynasty. Uh, the most significant one of these is the cultural hero of Yu, uh, who basically gave up his family to control the Yellow River. He was away from his family for 13 years. Um, story goes that he went by his house, he heard his wife and children crying, but he saw that the most important purpose was to get this Yellow River under control. And so what he did is he basically um, started to dredge the river with whatever tools he had available. Uh, he created parallel canals to the river. So once the river flooded, it would go into the canals first before devastating uh, the area around it. So in many ways, it was some of the first quite successful attempts to get the Yellow River under control. But the story also goes that uh, the last rulers of the Shia dynasty were not 
like you. We're not enterprising individuals, but we're more concerned about power, more concerned about themselves, more concerned about getting most fun out of life, turn into despots, and ultimately were overthrown, and a new dynasty would enter. That new dynasty would be the Shang dynasty. And, you know, again, historians, uh, and I'm not one of the traditional historians, but I should say traditional historians are much more comfortable with this second dynasty because here we have a lot of evidence. We can actually see, okay, here we have a, a dynasty that uh, left a lot of things behind, and the most important thing that this dynasty left behind are, is bronze art, very magnificent bronze art, because what you actually do have is uh, during the Shang Dynasty, you enter the Bronze Age in China. Uh, and if you don't know what bronze is, it's basically a mixture of two metals, uh, tin, and that's actually a small quantity of tin, and copper. People have been using copper for a long time, but if you know anything about copper, it's very soft. So if you make implements out of copper, uh, they very quickly uh, become unusable. But somebody has the great idea, you take a little bit of tin, you mix it to the copper, and all of a sudden become a very durable, uh, durable metal that you can use for all kinds of purposes. Whether it's warfare, agriculture, uh, art, as in this example, copper is really the thing to go with. It is also during the Shang Dynasty that we get the introduction of horse-drawn chariots. And uh, this is significant because it will change warfare. Uh, the horse-drawn chariot um, that uh, has probably been developed, as far as we know, uh, sometime uh, around 2000 BCE in uh, Mesopotamia and later also in Egypt, would become what some people would call the tank of antiquity. Uh, Horse-drawn chariots, of course, have a major advantage. First, they're fast. They can actually run circles around infantry. The people uh, driving these chariots would develop techniques. Sometimes you would have one person, one, sometimes you had two, uh, to uh, run the chariot without using your hands. And that's usually when you tie uh, the reins of the horses around your waist. So you have your hands available and you can use another major weapon, very uh, devastating weapon, which of course bow and arrows. And with this, you change the way people fight. And that's already one of the steps uh, that we see first developing in Mesopotamia, then in, in Egypt, but also in China. And it will become, as we shall see, a major element of the fighting as it takes place in China. Some of the other elements that we find during the Shang Dynasty is uh, a new way of, uh, well, writing, okay? Chinese writing, we do know the Chinese characters. Uh, the very uh, first evidence of writing that we get in China developing in connection with a particular practice. And the example is right over here. These things are known as oracle bones, oracle bones. And that tells you a lot already about how this practice works. Uh, really what you do is uh, you take uh, a particular bone that has a large surface. And uh, the best bones are your shoulder bones. You don't really use human shoulder bones, but you use the shoulder bones of oxen, because they have a long surface. Then you heat a bronze poker. And once this bronze poker is hot enough, you apply it to the particular bone. This is what it would look like. These are where you apply the bronze poker and then the bone starts to crack because of the heat that you have applied. And then you interpret those cracks, consequently oracle bones, because you interpret it. However you interpret these cracks on the bone, uh, you will ultimately write this on the front of the bone, and you get for the first time an introduction of a writing system. And this is again where historians feel more comfortable because for the first time you can use these oracle bones is some sort of historical record that tells you a lot about the culture because uh, the kind of questions they ask. And the kind of questions they ask is usually questions that you ask to departed family members or to departed individuals that you hold in high regard. What we see here is another major custom introduced into China, something that is still very much part of Chinese culture today, which is ancestor worship. Um, because your ancestors may have gone, they have moved on, 
but they're still there to guide you, to answer to your questions, to give you advice, and to connect to these ancestors using the oracle bones, to have some sort of conduit between the world here and the world of the departed. So we have already introduction now of Chinese characters, we have the introduction of ancestor worship, so we have already some of the major elements of Chinese culture, but more to come, yes. So the oracle bones are like a platform of writing? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's, that's how writing emerges. This, these are not yet the original Chinese characters, because one of the problems that you have is uh, you have several writing forms. It will not be until the Qing dynasty that writing is actually consolidated and unified. So much of the problem that you have as an archaeologist when you, when you go to the Shang dynasty and you're looking at these oracle bones is uh, first, there's lots of characters. Um, anybody here has taken Chinese? What's the most difficult part of Chinese language? The tonal thing, but also um, it's not an alphabet-based language, right? You have characters. It's similar to Egypt where you have hieroglyphics. So um, learning uh, often involves learning thousands of different characters. In this case of the oracle bones, it's even more difficult uh, because some of the characters you cannot decipher. And what you often need so you have in the case of Egypt, is some sort of a Rosetta stone, where you have actually an Egyptian alphabet, you have a Greek alphabet, and then you can make some sort of connection. You don't really have that. So what you, what you have to do in terms of the Shang dynasty is make some sort of inferences from characters that you have later on and project them back in the past. So it's really puzzle work. The other problem, and that's, that's nice that you bring up the question, is um, think of the oracle bones a little bit, uh, I mean, imagine, uh, I don't want this to happen, but our, our society is wiped out. And everything that's left is uh, <coughs> Axel Turback and Jeopardy. Okay? <laughs> so somebody comes and from, uh, from, uh, from the future and that's all they find. So you have to reconstruct a culture based on Jeopardy. Right? <laughs> Will that be a perfect uh, uh, representation of that culture? No. The answer is no. Uh, <laughs> but that's as good as it gets. Right? <laughs> So, so there are holes, they're definitely, and what you do is you use the oracle bones, you decipher them as much as possible, you use historical records that you have, but the problem with the historical records is they were written much, much later on, so, and then you get a little bit of picture. Is it a perfect picture? Unfortunately not. And you see this a lot in um, what Dr. Vulcan will tell you about how Chinese warfare ultimately works. It's very ritualistic. Uh, so um, initially, Chinese warfare doesn't cause a lot of casualties. Is that correct, Dr. Vulcan? You use a lot of sacrifice, including human sacrifice. So, uh, but all of this will change later on uh, yeah. to uh, the worst. What we do know a little bit about uh, the Shang Dynasty is um, we don't have, and again, we wish we would have this, but when you, when you go to places like Egypt, and you go to places like Mesopotamia, you have extensive law codes. The best example of this is the law code of Hammurabi, of course, uh, in Babylon, dominating uh, pretty much every single aspect of human life. You don't have that. Uh, most of the law uh, that you have in the Shang Dynasty is very informal, and it basically changes from ruler to ruler as these rulers rule by decree. So in other words, they basically say, well, the former ruler said that this is illegal, I'm going to legalize this and make something else legal. Okay? So what you do have is uh, basically is ruled by decree, and ultimately towards the end of the Shang Dynasty, towards the end of the Shang Dynasty, some uh, of the same patterns happen as during the Shia Dynasty. Uh, that some of these individuals use the rule by decree to become despots to basically uh, are not looking out for the people, are not looking out for the subjects, and ultimately what happens is the Shang dynasty is overthrown, and a third dynasty comes in. The third dynasty is the Zhou dynasty, and some people say that this dynasty is one of the most important one because it's during this dynasty that you get some of the main foundation of Chinese culture, okay? Uh, most importantly, the Mandate of Heaven. I will explain this in a little bit. Uh, but also think of some of the major philosophers um, coming about. Confucius, 
uh, Lao Tzu and Taoism. Dr. Volkan will tell you more about this. Um, and unfortunately also the philosophy of legalism. I'm saying unfortunately because legalism is not uh, a very kind philosophy. We'll get to this in a second. Now the Zhou, the rulers of the Zhou, realize that ruling by decree alone is not good, that you need to have some form of legitimizing yourself. Uh, the rulers of the Zhou realize, okay, we have overthrown the rulers of the Shang. We have to legitimize this overthrow. So they come in with a fairly uh, elaborate system of legitimizing your rule. Um, and as the Zhou dynasty uh, reflects upon its own dynasty, they're also looking back in the past. What happened to the Shia? What happened to the Shang? And uh, here is a very different kind of way of envisioning history. While in the, in the West, in the West, in Europe, you basically envision history as some sort of trajectory, starting here and going up. Um, in China, the trajectory is circular. You move in a circle. So in other words, you have the beginning of a dynasty. That dynasty establishes itself, it grows, it uh, ultimately develops some sort of golden age of this particular dynasty, and then it will decline. And the decline will ultimately lead uh, to losing, losing legitimacy, and a new dynasty will appear, and the whole cycle will repeat itself over and over again. And this cycle, this particular cycle, is known as the Mandate of Heaven. Now, the Mandate of Heaven is uh, it's a very important way of legitimizing your rule. First, uh, and this is quite important, different from many other societies that you find during this particular time period, the rulers in China are not divine. Okay? They, are, they are human beings. They are human beings. But these human beings are given a mandate. A mandate from an individual. Uh, and this individual is divine. It is actually seen as heaven. And heaven reigns of all. Heaven gives the mandate to the particular ruler who then becomes the son of heaven. It's an important uh, thing to remember here. And we'll go into the realm of Japan where the rulers are actually divine. In China, they are not. They're given a mandate from heaven. They're human beings and they have to respect that mandate. What is involved in this mandate? Well, uh, the mandate, of course, involves that you have respect for your subjects. As a good ruler, uh, you look out for social harmony. You make sure that everybody under you is well taken care of. And uh, because you have harmony with your subjects, you also have harmony with heaven, and you have harmony with the cosmos. The world is, if you like, and it's very oversimplified, in perfect balance. What happens when the ruler, what happens when the ruler uh, is no longer in harmony? When the ruler no longer respects the subjects? Well, then the universe is no longer in balance. Imbalance occurs. And uh, this imbalance is usually manifested by a number of things. Invasions from the outside especially uh, the so-called migrant people, uh, the forerunners of the Mongols, might invite, invade China. And these invasions are a sign that the ruler is losing the mandate of heaven. Some of the other things that may occur are catastrophes, floods. Again, the Yellow River goes over its bank. So the flood, boom, you know. Another way of telling that the ruler is not good. And lastly, of course, because of the floods, because of catastrophes, you might have famines, so people go hungry. And because you have these famines, and because you have the floods, because you have the invasions, the sign is clear that the dynasty is losing the mandate of heaven, and a new dynasty can step in and take over. Okay. So again, this is very much oversimplified, but uh, this is, uh, you know, basically, how it looks like. You ultimately have the foundation of a particular dynasty. Uh, the dynasty, the rulers of the dynasty, obtain the mandate of heaven, and uh, they reach some sort of uh, peak of prosperity. Everybody around them is happy uh, because you have these early emperors who are very much concerned about improving the life of the people that are under them. 
But then the rulers of this particular dy dynasty first become complacent, and in the worst case, they become withdrawn. They're just basically looking out for fun, they're looking out for themselves, they're no longer looking out for the society under them, and so what you have is, as it says, a period of steady decline that ultimately will lose and the loss. I mean, you lose the mandate of heaven. How long is one of these cycles? Again, that's an estimate, but it's several hundred years. Okay? And sometimes, and this is very important, uh, reaching the peak can be fast, and the ultimate decline can be a very, very long period. And if we go back to the beginning, well, let's not go back to the beginning, because this thing doesn't work. But um, the decline of the Zhou really falls into two periods. The first one, uh, don't write this down yet, is the spring and autumn period between 770 and 481. And I'm going to jump to the next slide, which is basically the main decline of the Zhou dynasty. It's known as the era of warring states. Just remember that two major periods. So, in other words, when it comes to the Zhou dynasty, the period of decline is a very long one. It lasts almost 500 years. But it's during these 500 years that you get some of the major foundation of what Chinese culture is like. All right, let's talk briefly, again, for each one of these periods, we could, you know, we could teach an entire class on, so I do apologize that I'm making major shortcuts here. Um, so just bear with me. And uh, we posted some of the readings where you find more detail if you're interested in this. So we also encourage you to take a class um, in Chinese history. We have several um, where you get a lot more detail. So what I'm presenting here is just the very bare bones of uh, Chinese history. So the first thing that Zhou do, and this is actually a good thing, is uh, since they're no longer ruling by decree, but they have this idea of mandate of heaven, they start decentralizing. So rather than holding power just by one single person, you actually uh, start to introduce a well-trained bureaucracy uh, that will ultimately staff um, a, n a number of institutions throughout your realm. Uh, but at the same time, as you are decentralizing, decentralization uh, always has a bad side effect, and the bad side effect is uh, that people who sit on the periphery of the Zhou dynasty realize, hey, you know, why should I respect the leaders of the Zhou? Why don't I try to take over the mandate of heaven and establish my own? So what you ultimately have is uh, the decentralization leading slowly to the decline of the Zhou dynasty. So what happens here, as I said, the, the rulers of the Zhou actually develop the mandate of heaven, but it will ultimately turn against them. Okay? So signs appear, there's catastrophes, invasions, all kinds of other things, that individuals are saying maybe it's time for the Zhou to go and a new dynasty to come in. Uh, it also, during this particular time period, the spring and autumn period, we have what uh, German philosopher and historian calls the Axial Age. And uh, again, this is an abstraction. There's no such thing. Uh, but historians like abstractions because it makes teaching much easier. And uh, what Karl Jaspers observed, um, and you may think about, now that we know a lot about world history, this seems kind of obvious. But he observed that between the third and the eighth century BCE, there were these massive changes occurring around the world. Not just in China, not just during the spring and autumn period, but they were occurring in Greece, where the Greek were developing rational thought. Uh, they were occurring in India, because it's uh, during this particular time period that you have the consolidation of Hinduism and the introduction of Buddhism as some of the ideas. And of course, in China, you have what individuals, again, greatly oversimplified, called the 100 schools of philosophy. I could, of course, give you every single one of these schools, uh, but uh, Dr. Vulcan still wants to talk about Zanzi, and it would take a long time, so I'm not going to give you all. But the most important ones are basically Taoism, Confucianism, and Legalism. And I don't want to talk too much about Taoism and Confucianism, because Dr. Vulcan will tell you, talk about Taoism and Confucianism in connection with martial arts that are connected to these particular thoughts. 
But let me just say this, all of these schools of thought try to address uh, an issue of chaos. As the Zhou dynasty is slowly descending into chaos, you have the development of uh, suffering among the people because of warfare, because of people fighting against each other. And all of these school of thoughts seek to address this. What is the best way to address this? And um, again, I'm greatly oversimplifying, and Dr. Vulcan, feel, feel free to correct myself, correct myself, but uh, Taoism basically believes that the decline of the Zhou is, uh, is caused very much by people thriving too much, by no longer being in touch with Tao, the way. Right? So they're basically arguing that you have to be in unison with the world around you. And once you are in unison with the world around you, then you will solve things. Again, oversimplified. Confucianism is different. They actually believe the world is in chaos because people are no longer respecting each other. You actually have to have a number of relationship among people. If you have a, a great relationship between ruler and subject, between older brother and younger brother, between husband and wife, between uh, older neighbor and younger neighbor, then you actually can create a hum harmonious society. Now, Confucianism, this is very interesting, uh, assumes, and many of these schools of thought, assume a very positive outlook of human nature. In comes the third school. Yeah. Um, the third school, which is legalism, and basically, legalism says, well, humans aren't really good people. Uh, you, you leave humans on their own devices, they will start to steal, to cheat, to lie. Um, so what you have to do is you basically have to teach human beings a lesson, a harsh lesson. So, um, and the best way to do so is through punishment. Not just regular punishment, an eye for an eye, but actually punishment that exceeds the crime. So in other words, you, you know, you're driving down the freeway, you throw something out of the window, um, you have to pay a fine. That's what we do here. What if you throw something out of the window and the police stops you, takes you out of the car and chops off your right hand? Will you throw garbage on the street again? Probably not. Right? That's what I mean by a punishment exceeding the crime, uh, because it teaches others a lesson, uh, not just you, but it teaches people around you a lesson. Then the other uh, thing that legalism will do is when you get punished, it's not just you that gets punished, but also your parents, your siblings, because they're supposed to watch over you. And since you did a bad thing, then obviously they neglected this, so they will also be punished. So what you create a little bit is an atmosphere of fear. Okay, where everybody just uh, mistrusts each other. So legalism is based on this sort of notion, the only way you can control human nature is by really, really coming down on the people and punishing them for even some of the most smallest of crimes. And we're going to see that a little bit in the movie uh, The Emperor and the Assassin that we're screening next week. So um, that is the spring and autumn period. Uh, again, you have many different schools of thought, but the most important thing that they have in common is how can we create a better world? A world where everybody gets along. Taoism believes the world is out of sync and it needs to be in sync again. It's, uh, it's almost a philosophy uh, that advocates um, that you need to reflect, <coughs> that you need to lean back. In some cases, you need to even abandon uh, your life and go into the monastery. Confucianism believes that the only way this can be solved is by engaging in life, uh, by basically being kind to other people. Because if you're kind to other people, then the other people will be kind to you, or you will be paying it forward. You're kind to somebody, holding their door or whatever it is, then that person will do that also. Okay. So that's what Confucianism is. Legalism. Legalism will start to repairing the world by basically saying, I'm sorry, it's not that the world is out of sync, it's not that people uh, are not kind to each other is because people are just bad. And the only way you can cure bad people is by punishing them harshly. Yes? So do you have different um, areas in China practicing Taoism, Confucianism, and Legalism? Yes. Or is it um, like the rulers at the time that are practicing that certain... I think that will, be the, that will be the right answer, the second one, right? 
I know for Taoism, there's lots of different types of Taoism. That too. And um, there's many different schools. And so they're not, they're, 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 there's a lot of overlap, but then there's some things that are very specific to the schools. And there's really, there's a rural version and a court version. And we'll talk about some of those stuff. I don't know about legalism, but I know Taoism has lots of variations. I'll get to legalism. There is variations in all of these ideas, obviously. Um, the most important one of these is uh, Confucianism. There's Neo-Confucianism when you get into the Ming Dynasty in the 1500s. When Neo-Confucianism combines many of the other ideas, it, it combines some Taoism, it combines some legalism. Legalist scholars, as the title implies, uh, often are more concerned about law and the making of law. Uh, while Taoism is concerned about law, but it's actually about finding the law because the law is already out there. Makes sense? Yes. Whereas Confucianism is all about law too, but it's all about relationships. And one of the best things uh, to really um, remember Confucianism is, and this is what you're doing here in the university, you want to staff your bureaucracies with the best people possible. So you actually go out there and you have exams, uh, grueling exams, uh, that take weeks and weeks and weeks to select the best bureaucrats because they will the ones who will run the country the best. And what you often have, and that your question is absolutely right, that rulers, once they come to the throne, they have to decide what they're going to. Taoism, mm, you know, there are many times of Taoism, again, I'm oversimplifying, it's not the best thing as a ruler to opt because it implies, you know, contemplation and withdrawing from the world you're in. So most rulers tend to tend to choose either Confucianism or legalism. And, and you'll Lao see some of some of legalism also in in in, in uh, Lao Tzu. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and and as I'll talk, at least from the school of Taoism that I learned, Confucianism and Taoism are the flip side of the same principle. Very good. So they which not all not all scholars agree with, but hopefully I'll convince you all. But they're flip side. You know, Confucianism is Taoism applied to human society. And vice versa, a human society, it's applied to Taoism, and you'll see legalistic ideas in Taoism, you know, um, such as, you know, love, love your friends and hate your enemies, you know. Taoism is very simple, you know, people do bad things, you get rid of them, right? And that's a legalist kind of idea. So we'll, we'll see some of that. At least the stuff that I learned. No, absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, that's, you know, again, what we're doing here, I mean, just think of the variations you have in Christianity or Islam. I mean, you know, trying to put all of this under one term is not so simple. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of subdivisions here, a lot of uh, intermingling between the different approaches. And what I'm presenting you and Dr. Volkan will present to you is often a very distilled down version of these particular approaches. So. Um, because people realize that, hey, some parts of legalism is actually good, have, have a nice law code. And um, unfortunately, up until recently, China has still had aspects of legalism. Um, you know, that individuals <coughs> get put to death if you, you know, do sabotage in the workplace, for instance. I think some of that stuff's still around. Is it? Okay, I, I want to say it's not, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, some legalistic techniques uh, and often what happens when you get executed in China, unfortunately, is um, the family gets charged for the bullet. Yeah. Which again, it's a principle of legalism because um, you have committed the crime, your family has to pay. So There are still elements of this even in the 21st century, China. Fortunately, not just China uh, because you see any sort of... Um, extreme regime, I mean, just think whether it's Nazi Germany, shameless plug for the spring class, of course, uh, there are aspects of legalism there as well. Yeah, I think there was a case, something in the news, maybe a couple months ago, that somebody, somebody in China, you know, they, they caught one of these officials who was doing some corrupt stuff, and I believe they sentenced him to death. I think that yes. was, you know, the drug dealers often uh, sentenced to death. Um, so you'll see that's little right. fringes of, of legalism. Fringes of legalism are still with us, right? And, and it's interesting because uh, the debates that you have sometimes even in this country about you know, punishment and what right punishment is, uh, debates in most countries whether you should have capital punishment. I mean, capital punishment, of course, uh, is not necessarily legalistic, but uh, 
the notion of taking somebody's life uh, flies in the face of the ability to reform somebody. Um, so again, legalism believes that not only will you set an example with the person, but you will also set an example for those around uh, to not go down that path. Uh, unfortunately, evidence shows that extreme legalistic uh, legal systems do not always uh, achieve their goals. I just put it this way. It's interesting also when you see changes happening even in this country. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Right. So the spring and autumn period. Best known for developing the 100 school of thoughts. Three of them. We just talked about Taoism, Confucianism, and legalism. Uh, but things get worse. We're still in the decline of the Zhou. Uh, what we have towards the end of the Zhou dynasty is what is called the era of warring states, okay, between 481 and 221 BCE. And uh, this particular uh, time period is called this because uh, the Zhou dynasty, that's where the laser pointer is, that little dot, mm -hmm. that is the heartland of the Zhou. That's how the decline has already, is, is already active. So the Zhou are really no longer in control of anything that's going on. And what you have is a number of states that are developing around the Zhou, each one trying to claim the mandate of heaven, each one trying to start a new dynasty. And uh, the most important one will be this one, the Qin dynasty. Because this one will ultimately use its connection to uh, the hinterland by acquiring horses, lots of arms, lots of uh, soldiers to unify all of China under their command. And as you will see in the movie of um, the movie, The Emperor of the Assassin, <coughs> the consolidation is not done through peaceful means, but is done through war. <coughs> Consequently, the era of warring states. So the era of warring states uh, is also, and this is a very important uh, thing, is to see, also sees a shift in fighting. And again, I don't want to take too much away from uh, Dr. Vulcan's lecture, but during the, during the Shang and <coughs> the Zhou dynasty, most of the fighting is being, it's mostly done symbolically. Uh, you have two rulers who meet. There's a little bit of symbolic fighting, often involving some human sacrifice, and then it's decided who won, right? Isn't that what you, you're going to give us some details of this? Uh, when we get into the era of warring states, uh, this sort of symbolic fighting gives way to real fighting. And the reason why you do this is first you have a major shift in the manufacture of arms. You move away from bronze, we talked about bronze earlier, tin and copper, to actually make even more powerful weapons. We're entering China's Iron Age. We're basically moving to iron which makes much stronger weapons, much stronger swords. And it's also, and this is quite important, it's also easier to manufacture, so you can make more weapons. Uh, bronze, uh, especially tin, is a particular metal that you don't find everywhere. But iron is actually plentiful um, all over China, so you can mass produce swords, uh, mass produce lances, mass produce um, arrow tips, that you can use as weapons of mass destruction. And mass is basically the term here. Uh, what you see during the Arab Warring States is that the armies go on the increase. Initially, the symbolic kind of warfare involved several hundred soldiers. Uh, when you move into the era of Warring States, of course, you get the very famous Terracotta Army, uh, which you find, of course, in Xi'an, China, where you have thousands of warriors buried with, I think, Kevin, you have been to that tomb, haven't you? I have. I have not, but you know, I always wanted to go. Uh, this is Xin Xuan Di, <coughs> and uh, he is the ruler of the, the first and only, interesting, the first and only ruler of the Qing dynasty. And um, you will see him in the movie, The Emperor and the Assassin, but when he dies, his tomb, his very elaborate tomb will have thousands of these warriors 
And uh, what is so wonderful about the Terracotta Army, of course, is that each one of these warriors has different facial features. You know, it's just a magnificent uh, work of art, but it also gives us an idea of what these early armies looked like. Their armor, and most of the armor they're using is leather, uh, but there's also some iron mixed in there. Uh, you can see, um, you can see what they were using as weapons. So this terracotta army is also, and this is the most important one, the shift to the mass army. Uh, how do you recruit the mass army, and who do you use for the mass army? You're using peasants. So in other words, you're recruiting not just hundreds of people into these mass armies, but thousands. And you will see some of this in the movie, The Emperor and the Assassin. So um, because this movie was made in 1999, so it's a bit dated, but um, it's for the first time that Chinese um, companies, of course, talking to Hollywood, are using uh, computer animated, so you see some of these mass armies in this particular movie. And again, when you look very closely, you will see that these mass armies that you see in the movie are very much inspired by the terracotta army that you find in the grave of Qing Shuangdi. So the Qing dynasty uh, will ultimately win um, the era of warring states. So after two, 221 uh, BCE, China becomes unified. Um, I mean, you had dynasties before, but the, the Qin dynasty really managed to unify. And it's also some of the first to uh, build a gigantic wall to keep the invaders out. This is the beginning, if you like, of the Great Wall of China. I should add to that that most of what you see of the Great Wall today are actually uh, changes made by the, the Ming dynasty in the 1400s and going into the 1500s, so uh, you don't really see a whole lot of sections of the Great Wall of China dating back to about 200 BC. Just saying that. And the reason why um, the Qing Dynasty was very able to do this, again, has a lot to do with um, their, their basically unified already existing, existing uh, segments of the wall and brought it all together. Now, the Qing Dynasty was run by uh, a fairly ruthless uh, emperor. And I'm saying fairly ruthless because the movie does a good, good job of portraying him, that he ultimately has good thoughts and a good heart, but he becomes corrupted. He becomes enamored of, uh, of his own ideas. And uh, to some extent, he also uh, is somebody who has vengeance in his heart. So he's not uh, a virtuous ruler, but he's really out to, to seek revenge on others. Xin Chuan-Di uh, also is one to basically decide, again coming back to your question, to decide that legalism is the way to go. Okay, so uh, he's not a big friend of Confucianism, not a, I mean as far as we know, not a great friend of Taoism, but he decides that legalism, the extreme form of legalism, is the best way to unify the country. Since all of these extreme measures are done during the Qing Dynasty, his rule, uh, I should say, the Qing Dynasty basically ends with him. When he dies, that whole dynasty collapses and uh, enters the Han Dynasty. And the Han Dynasty very quickly will move away from legalism and bring back Confucianism. So that's why I wanted to say. So the movie you're going to see next week, I'm not going to be here, but Dr. Vulcan will take that one over, is about two hours and 30 minutes. And it does very nicely portray uh, the rise of Xin Shuan Di, uh, the first, he's sometimes also known as the first emperor, the first emperor since the first one to unify all of China. And again, um, historians have sometimes, uh, you portray them in a really dark light. This movie actually shows them as a very enthusiastic ruler, a very, very kind person that uh, becomes slowly corrupt by power and shifts into a uh, not so nice person. Um, there's a couple of things, however, that Qin Shuan Di did that is really important. First, uh, he consolidated Chinese language. As I mentioned before, there were many different writing systems before. He would unify this. He would unify all of the, mm, the weights and measures, which is important as well. Uh, if you have a vast area under your control, you want to make sure that everybody has the same measurements, everybody has the same kind of 
Uh, you know, it's, it's always funny when somebody from Europe like myself comes to the United States and I have to deal with gallons rather than leaders. Just get on the metric system. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, th these are just things that, you know, th these are just things that he did. He just established, you know, a unified system, so that's a good thing. Um, and clearly, uh, he provided the foundation for subsequent dynasties uh, to thrive. Uh, one of the th good, not so good things, uh, I should say, um, since he raised these mass armies, he had to find some place for them to go. So what he often did is he had some of these mass armies, after unifying all of China, work on the Great Wall of China. And uh, some of the work that was performed here was grueling. And uh, there are even stories, again, these are stories, about Qin Shi Huang Di uh, basically entombing live people in the wall to give them some sort of spiritual longevity. Uh, again, that's probably not something that the subjects like to see. And uh, again, that's one explanation why the dynasty fell at his death. And he yeah, did it in an hour. Yes. <laughs> I, know, I know that's uh, you know, a lot to take home, but um, there are chapters in your readings if you want more detail. Um, there are also some pictures that you can find about Shang, Shang Bronze. I mean, there's tremendous things that uh, could be talked about. I just glossed over. So I encourage you all to do the readings. So why don't we take